never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. What's up, guys? Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling today? I have a meme for you just to get you started. I can't help myself. I just had to. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw a Navi walking in this morning. A Navi, what's up? How are you? Good morning. A Navi gave me a great idea. I don't know if you saw. She has a Cookie Monster mask on. Which do not, you know me, I would wear that and be proud every day. I think we should have a mask competition every Sunday. What do you think? Right? Yeah, let's do this. Let's go all out. Man, uh, I appreciate you guys being here so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, uh, enduring the mask and, and the social distancing as I'm looking out at you, man, I'm seeing new faces and I'm so excited that you're here, but I'm also like, oh man, we're about full for like what we need to do social distance wise. You know, I've been praying for two services. I, I don't know if this is what I had in mind, but we, you know, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure it out. Uh, I also want you to know that uh, today's service is being recorded. we got a camera right back there. So welcome uh, all of our uh, viewers who are going to be watching this online, which is pretty exciting for us. Uh, I want you to know it's been maybe, what, what's it been, five months, six months? Yeah, we, we were, <laughs> some of you were like, it's been 187 days, you know, like, you know exactly how long it's been. But we were, we were in a season as a church, man. We were rolling, we're like we were excited. We had just hired a new children's minister named Thaddeus, and we were getting him plugged in, and, and we were getting started. Like, yes, man, we're gonna, children's ministry is about to take off. And, and, and Kim, our worship leader, just came back off maternity leave. We were like, yes, Kim is back. We are ready to go. And then, yeah, and then, COVID-19 happened, and in the course of a week, we went from Hug and Howdy Church to, like, See You Later Church. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, 
And, and we have been doing, I, I don't, this is crazy, like we had never done church online, we'd never done church at home, we'd never done any of that stuff, and we made the turn on a dime. And so honestly, I just want to say, we, we need to spread some thanks out. We need to say thanks to Kim and to Thaddeus and to AC. Yeah, for, I mean, uh, all of these people, like, uh, and Jeremiah and Brian, like, these people, like, we we shifted on, <laughs> out of nowhere, we shifted on, and I said, okay, all right, we're going to be televangelists now. We can do this. We got this. And I want you to know, like, it's crazy, but, like, uh, uh, even the camera that we're recording on today is borrowed. Like the church owns zero video equipment. Everything we've done, we've got to beg, borrow, and steal to get done. But that being said, man, we are, have plans to go uh, to live stream, which is something I don't know that any of us at Aspen, did we ever think, you know, live stream, that's where Aspen Grove's going. But man, it's, I think it's the best option for our future. We want to see everybody that's tuning in at home. And, and, and we, we know that there are those of you who are at home. And that's the right choice for you. That's the right choice for you. And so, but we want to have a shared worship experience together. So our plan is to shift to a live stream. Right now, what you're seeing is being recorded. It'll be showed next week online. But we want to do it together, right? Like, that's who we are as a church. We want to worship together. And so we're looking at live stream. We've got bids. We're looking at uh, spending some money, which is a little bit frightening for us. But, man, we, we think a shared worship experience together is the best way. And so Kim's working hard on that. Man, there's, there's a lot of people working hard on that to hopefully see that happen very soon. Um, I hope you grabbed your, did you, did you get your little communion cup as you walked in the door? If you did not grab one, we are, we're going to take this together after the teaching today. But if you did not grab one, I give you permission right now. You can just stand up and go get one, right? I'm doing announcements anyway. I'm, you're not paying attention anyway. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Somebody come up with a name for these communion things for me. Does anybody have a good name or what, what do you call them? Snack packs. Snack packs. <laughs> Communion snack packs. Yeah, perfect. Make sure each week you gain your snack pack. We will take this together uh, after the teaching today. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, our mission as a church is to grow followers of Jesus Christ. Man, that, that means worship. That means community. That means service. That means discipleship. It, it means so many things. And uh, But our, our honestly, our, our heart is to see every single person fall in love with Jesus Christ, to come to the life that only He can offer. And we believe that that can happen today, even in this space. And so uh, uh, if you're a guest here, we want to say welcome, that we're, we're so excited that you're here. But if there's ways that our church can pray for you or serve you, man, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I want to remind you, if you are a guest, we have connection cards at our tithe and offering boxes at the back. You can always just drop those in the box. If you're tuning in online, just email prayer at aspengrovecc.com. And someone, man, we, we'd love to just gather around you as within six feet or something like that. Uh, I am uh, also going to direct you to our website. Please uh, keep checking out our website for news and events and updates. If you're at home, you can always make your tithe and offerings uh, uh, online. There's links for that. But there's also links to, uh, we're, right now we're really excited to have a couple of different Discovery Bible studies that are happening online, which is just helping read the Bible together. There are lots of great news and opportunities. What's coming up in our student ministry, what's coming up in our children's ministry. Please make sure and check out our website. Uh, finally, this morning, I'm really excited to welcome Craig Fry. You can go ahead and come up here, Craig. Uh, Craig has served um, in leadership in both the church and the marketplace and is currently the president of Christian Leadership Concepts. He has a very lovely wife named Wendy, which I'm not sure how you pulled that one off, but well done. Well done. You married up. That's, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Uh, and you have four daughters, correct? Yep. God bless you. Need prayer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Craig and I, I'll, you can, I'll, I'll stand on this side of the stage. Craig and I met through a mutual friend, and uh, he told me about his life and his ministry, the ways he served churches, and uh, even, even served in the marketplace, and now is back really leading through uh, a Christian leadership concepts. And uh, as soon as we sat down together, I knew, you know, you ever have that feeling just like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. This is, as soon as we sat down, it was like, okay, yep, Craig's a brother from another mother. Like, this is, <laughs> like, we are totally, like, just aligned together. And so I asked Craig to fill in for me this week and to share a teaching with us. And he said, Adam, what do I talk about? I was like, encouragement. Encouragement. <laughs> I think that's what our world and our church needs. So, man, I'm excited to have you. Welcome this morning. We guys welcome Craig. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Great to be with you guys. This is a good looking bunch of Christians right here, I'm telling you. And uh, awesome opportunity for me to share a word of encouragement and grace. Aren't you glad that God is good all the time? Aren't you? Aren't you glad that he's got a plan even when we can't see it? Aren't you glad? Well, I want to take a little trip down memory lane. If you will join me, uh, I'm going to share a childhood memory with you. The year was 1976, and I sat in a movie theater in Nashville, and I was watching a Sylvester Stallone film. Now, I wasn't a big Stallone fan, but I'd heard some good news about this particular movie, it was a movie titled Rocky. And as you remember, if you're old enough, Rocky was about a washed up street boxer from inner city Philadelphia. So the story unfolds and we see Rocky has the opportunity to fight the heavyweight champion of the world. This was a PR stunt more than anything else, but Rocky took it seriously. This was his shot. As you sat in the theater, you could feel the tension build. We entered into Rocky's life. And we, we ran those dark streets with him. We drank raw eggs with him. And when the fight was on, yo, Adrian, we all became one with that movie. And we fought in the ring with him. People in the theater were throwing popcorn up in the air. They jumped up and down. They yelled at the screen. They flinched with every punch. It was wild, baby, wild. And even now, I can see him running up those steps and standing to the top. Cue Rocky's theme song, right? There are very few stories more famous than Rocky, but we're going to talk about one today. A very similar story in the sense that when you're talking about David and Goliath, you're talking about overcoming the odds. You're talking about a nobody becoming a somebody. You're talking about a young shepherd boy standing against a nine-foot-tall professional warrior where right wins over wrong, hope overcomes discouragement, courage defeats fear, and God comes through for the little guy. That's a story that we need today, don't you think? First of all, the battle is unavoidable. You see that in the first two verses that we're going to examine today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. Look at it with me. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites another, with the valley between them. Now, at this point in history, geography played a very important role in battle because they were restricted to ground combat. With no airplanes, no tanks, just man on man. This battle took place in an area called Ephes Damim, a valley, a canyon, literally, a mile wide separated by two mountain slopes. Now, notice this. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites another with the valley between them. Why is this important? It's important because the terrain forced the competing armies to face each other. And there was no way to back down. No way to retreat. Here's application point number one if you're taking notes. Temptation and testing are unavoidable. 
Listen to the testimony of James 1-2. Consider it pure joy. That means unfiltered joy, meaning you don't have to fake it joy, meaning I'm not talking about put on a smiley face and grin and bear it, but find a place of peace and confidence, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith brings perseverance. Now notice, very critical. The Bible doesn't say if we face trials. It says when we face trials. Trials are going to happen to everybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you live. I don't care what your station in life. You and I are going to face trials and tough times. Now, there are a lot of television preachers who've made a lot of money telling us we can live in a world where troubles don't exist. But I got news for you. That is not in the Bible. All of us are going to encounter tough times. And we're encountering, encountering those tough times now. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7-9. through 9. We have this treasure, meaning our faith. We have this faith treasure in jars of clay, meaning they're housed in our human bodies, to show this power is from God and not from us. We are pressed on every side but not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Two major teaching points in that beautiful passage. Number one, the purpose of trials is to show this power is from God, not from us. The assumption is that we are going to overcome this trouble because God is on our side. And this power to overcome does not come from within us. It comes from God as a fully formed gift. Secondly, our protection in trials. We are pressed but not crushed. We are perplexed but not despairing. We are persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. So we'd all like to know, well, how can I get out of this mess? How can I overcome? A better question, one that I'm not quick enough to recognize is, how do I cope with this mess while I'm in it? I know that ultimately, somehow, someday, God is going to bring me through it, but I'm in a pickle right now. I'm overwhelmed right now. I'm stressed out right now. What can I do now? And this points me back to God where I should have been in the first place. You know, when I get in trouble, I'm just going to confess to you. I get in trouble when I take my eyes off of God, when I take my eyes off of his eternal word, and I try to figure it out myself. Has anybody fallen, fallen prey to that? You've tried to figure it out. And the last place you go is the first place you should have gone, and that's to say, God, will you help me? Application point number two, when the heat is on, we find out what we're really made of. Here's a quote from Albert Schweitzer, who said, the same fire that burns trash refines metal. The key is not the heat of the fire, but the quality of the material to which it is applied. You know when I learned the most from God? You know when I learned the most from God's Word? When I run out of my own resources. And then God stretches me, and He grows me, and He takes me places that aren't comfortable for me. And I wouldn't go there if it weren't for God leading me by the hand. And when I get to that place, I learn more about myself, and I learn more about God. But keep in mind, this time of testing, this time of battle, it's unavoidable. What do we know about the enemy? Look back at the primary text. Let's look at verses 4 through 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose and have him come down to me. 
If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Let's talk about the size of the enemy first. Goliath was no small tater. I mean, this sucker was nine feet tall. Can you imagine someone being nine feet tall? His coat weighed over 200 pounds. Did you hear me? His coat weighed over 200 pounds. The point of his spear weighed 25 pounds. But this is the key. Compared to David, he was a dwarf. How can I say that? How can this be true? Easy. David knew God, and everybody was about to know that David knew God. Here's application point number one. Identify your giants and realize you don't fight alone. So let's get specific. What giants are you facing right now? Is it a financial mountain? Is it a marriage problem? Is it a career transition, a health concern, a moral crisis, a relationship breakup? Is it a family issue that's unraveling before you? Are you battling an addiction? Is it restructuring brought on by COVID-19? What is it? I can almost guarantee you it's something you've never encountered before. You didn't expect it to happen. But it's big, isn't it? It's big. Next, notice the taunts of the enemy. It wasn't just Goliath's physical size that was intimidating. Twice a day, he would come out to the mountainside and taunt the people of God. For 40 days in a row, he challenged those that he called, notice this in verse 8, the slaves of Saul. He didn't say the people of God. He said the slaves of Saul. For 40 days, they listened to his insults. Meanwhile, they stood on the other side of the canyon, paralyzed with fear. And if the fear wasn't enough, imagine the shame that the people of God must have felt. Because Goliath wasn't just challenging their manhood, oh no. He was challenging the essence of their faith. Now keep in mind, they were God's chosen people, loved by Him, sustained by Him, but they were unable to keep from dropping their heads in shame in the face of this giant and his ridicule. And I can imagine no one felt this shame any heavier than King Saul. He should have been Goliath's match. He was Israel's largest and most gifted warrior. And earlier in his life, when the Spirit of God rested on him, he was fearless and he was valiant, wasn't he? But then years of sin and forsaking God took root in his life. And now, according to verse 11, he, along with everybody else, was terrified. Can I share a moment of honesty with you? Wouldn't it be great if preachers got honest every now and then? Well, I'm about to. I can experience the same thing when it comes to spiritual and emotional battles. I can wake up every morning, walk to the battle line, look across the valley, and see my problem just standing there taunting me. It happens every single day. But you know what I've come to realize? The more I delay in battling that giant, whatever that giant may be, the more intimidating that giant becomes and the harder it is to handle later. So notice what David did. Number one, he showed up. Number two, he surveyed the situation. And then number three, with God's help, he cleaned house. As a result of David's trust in God and his inner resolve, the Israelites didn't have Goliath to worry about anymore. Application point number two. Your life will get better once your God becomes bigger. COVID-19 is big. It's a pandemic, some say, right? God's bigger. What you're facing at work, it may be tough, really tough. God's tougher. Health issue that you're battling, maybe nobody even knows about it right now. Guess what? God's still in charge. He's still on his throne. 
Nothing shifts, nothing changed with God. God is huge. Will you let him be huge? Will you let the God in your life be bigger than he's ever been before? That's when you realize victory. But you better have a battle plan. And that leads us to verses 32 through 39. Look with me. 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 39. As soon as I can find it, I'll read it to you. There it is. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Two more verses. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. So what is our battle plan? May I suggest, number one, to recount previous victories, just like David did. God had demonstrated his faithfulness to David long before this event. Remember the story of the bear and the lion? That was all about God, a lot more than David. So to David, the Philistine was just another challenge for God to overcome. He had proven faithful before. What would stop him from doing it again? So we can remind ourselves of benchmarks of faith when tough times come against us. We can remind ourselves of those benchmarks daily. And here's a great passage of Scripture to bring to your memory bank. If God is for you, and He is, who can be against you? Reminder, David didn't know he was going to fight Goliath that day. Think about it. There was no advance prep for this. I mean, the only reason he was at the battlefield was to take lunch to his three brothers. It's very possible David didn't even know who Goliath was. But that's the way it is with spiritual giants. We never expect them. We're not prepared for them. They just show up. That's why it is important in advance to be a person of faith and a person of confidence in God. And God-sized confidence was something David had long before he needed it on this day. Second is to cast off false security. Let me explain. King Saul made an interesting gesture. He offered his armor to David. Now, I say it's interesting because only the king and the king's family had access to full battle dress. But David was a shepherd boy, and he had no experience with this kind of armor. armor. So he wisely chose his only defense, the defense he knew best from his past, a slingshot and the Lord. And it worked out, didn't it? Here's an application point. Never assume that what works for somebody else to defeat their spiritual giant will automatically work for you in defeating yours. Little background. Chapter 16 says that David was ruddy. That means two things. Number one, he was healthy, but it can also mean he was a little bit on the scrawny side. So when he put Saul's armor on, he probably looked like a smurf. I mean, it just overwhelmed him. And so what did he do? He discarded the armor of Saul and said, I don't think I need to use this. Here's the point. David fought his battle the way God asked him to fight his battle. The same principle holds true for us. 
God created you in a unique way, with unique giftings and skills and talents and opportunities. And that means when you battle your giants, He, God, will give you a unique way to defeat your giants. In short, listen carefully, your giants are your giants. And you, you can't approach them trying to be somebody you're not. So if you're an intellectual, then use your mental prowess to reveal the fallacies of a world that doesn't even acknowledge God. If you're an effective planner, then prepare a short-term and long-term strategy to meet life's challenges head on. Maybe you're a relationship builder. Then surround yourself with Christian friends who can lift you up and speak truth into your life. Maybe you're an introvert. Maybe you're quiet and introspective. Then use those times of solitude to renew your spirit and rest in the knowledge of God's grace. The main point is to be who God created you to be and to be that person at the time when you need God the most. So trust Him and trust that He has given you everything you need to be victorious in every situation. Now we get to the good part. Verses 45 through 52 talks about the spoils of victory. Look with me. Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered he'll, will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharem road to Gath and Ekron. Holy moly. God showed up, didn't he? But David understood he, who he was, and then he understood who God was through him. He had a battle strategy, and he stuck with it. How many of you know, and I've already cheated, and I've read the end of this book. Guess what happens at the end of this book? We win. We win. The score's already been decided. How many of you would sign up today for the winning team, knowing that you're guaranteed to win? All of us. Well, guess what? We win. All we have to do is rely upon God and have a strategy to get through this thing. Now, I stand before you proudly, five foot nine. Every bit of me, five foot nine. That's how God made me. I'm never going to be in the NBA. I'm never going to be asked to join the volleyball team. Nope, not happening because I'm five foot nine. But God can use me even though I'm short. And he can use you even though you're tall. And maybe you're smarter than me. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. Then do what God has called you to do. Maybe you can sing better than I can. Then sing like a crazy person. God is going to use you no matter what. God wins. And if you know God, you win. I'll tell you a story. When I, was a, when I was in the fifth grade, these older boys in my elementary school were picking on my sister. My sister was in the third grade, and one day they pushed her down in the alleyway that connected our house with the elementary school. Oh, my blood boiled. Pushing down my little sister. Now, I can push down my little sister, but you better not lay a hand on my little sister. 
And they did, and they pushed her down to the ground. And she started to cry, and I got mad. And so I went home to my dad, and I said, Dad, you need to help me. My dad boxed in the Air Force. He was pretty good. He said, well, you're a little dude. <laughs> so you're a little dude, so you better have a strategy. And here's the strategy, Craig. Listen carefully. Hit first, hit hard, run fast. <laughs> good strategy, huh? So the next day on the way to school, here come these bullies. And I got a run and start, and I just knocked them into next week. I cold cocked them. They didn't even see me coming. And then I picked up my sister, Becky, and I said, run! And we ran. My dad was right, wasn't he? Well, guess what? You've got a battle plan, too. You've got weaknesses. You've got strengths. You've got blind spots. But God has a plan for you to win. And here's application point number one. Faith creates boldness. David's speech, I challenge you to go back and read that speech again, because this wasn't a threat. This was a promise. David announced that he came in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God you, Goliath, have defied. And as a result, everyone would know, get this, the battle is the Lord's. I love David's boldness. It's inspiring, isn't it? David believed that God would show up despite the circumstances. My dad put it this way. If David had turned back, nobody would have blamed him. Of course, no one would have remembered him either. Live a life worth remembering. Be bold, be strong, because the battle is God's. Application point number two. Faith is a reminder of God's love. I love your pastor's heartbeat. He has said to me now on five different occasions, love on my people good. Love those people. He loves you. You feel it too, don't you? You don't have to be around that guy more than five minutes to know that he loves Jesus and he loves you guys. Faith gave him that love for you. His relationship with Jesus and his love for Jesus is translated into love for you. Faith is a reminder of God's love. I'm reminded of this basic truth. Everything of eternal value originates with God, not me. The truth is, I wouldn't know anything about faith. I wouldn't know anything about eternity. I wouldn't know anything about unconditional love. I wouldn't know anything about anything bigger than myself if God hadn't revealed that anything to me. Let me give you a strange example. It'll seem strange, but then it'll make sense toward the end. In the state of Tennessee, there is no law on the books that says a mother must take care of her child. There's no law. No law in the state of Tennessee that says, Mama, you have to take care of your kids. That's odd, isn't it? No, it's not odd at all. Ladies, imagine if a law enforcement officer came to your home and said, are you taking care of your babies today? You know, the law of the state of Tennessee says you have to love your kids. No, they don't need that law. Why? Because any mother worth a hoot would say, I don't need a law to tell me to take care of my baby. Why not? Because she loves her babies more than life itself. In the same way, it would be one thing if God sent out an invitation to the banquet of heaven and addressed it to whom it may concern. No. You have an invitation personally, personally engraved with your name on it. God himself drives up to your front door, rings the doorbell, walks into your house, gives you a new set of clothes, picks you up, puts you in the car, drives you to the banquet, and then literally carries you to the seat of honor at the table. That is precisely what God is doing for you. What did you do? You just came to him in faith, and he gave you everything else. So look to God as the lover of your soul. And look to God as the one who shapes all things for your good. And when you look to God in this way, you will see his love for you in all things, even the stinky things. 
Because no matter what may come your way, you will know that you are held securely and eternally by God's love. Final application point. Faith creates a climate of courage for other people. I love the fact, and I don't miss this, David's courage was more contagious than the fear that came from Saul. Saul thought Goliath was too big to fight. David thought he was too big to miss. That's good. You need to write that down. I don't, that's good. I'm going to say that again. Saul thought Goliath was too big to fight. David thought he was too big to miss. So let me leave you with a truth I believe with all my heart. If a handful of Christians would take God at His word and live consistently and diligently and fearlessly, their testimony would do more to alter the course of man than anything else in the world. The fact of the matter is, friends, we can change the world. The name of the Lord is our banner, and God will deliver us no matter what or who stands before us. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to buy a slingshot. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for being a great God, a big God, a loving God. We offer ourselves to you with all our strengths and weaknesses and blind, shots, uh, blind spots. You chose us and you gave us the opportunity to respond in faith. I pray we do that, that we would grow in confidence that even during this time of, of unrest and weirdness, we would see your face and know that in the end, we win because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So it's our tradition at Aspen Grove to uh, share in communion every single week. And so I don't know what tradition you grew up in. Maybe communion was uh, not in your tradition. Maybe it was something you did quarterly or monthly. But uh, if you receive those elements, I'll invite you to go ahead and get them out. In just a minute, I will lead us and we'll uh, take, take this together. Uh, but before we do that, um, I need to welcome somebody. Uh, we've got a lot of guests here today, which is great, and that's awesome. I, I hope you've uh, been blessed and feel welcomed by, uh, uh, or have felt welcome. But there's one person I want to extend a really special welcome to you to. Uh, if there was one family in our church that, that you had to say, you know, they've really done it. They've got plenty of kids. They don't need any more. If there's one family in our church that said, you know, whew, they have done their, their parental duty. They're, they're full up. What family would you say? The Vermas family. And yet, this week, the Vermases welcomed one more to the family. And so this morning, we want to welcome Jason. He is so embarrassed right now. Can we do something? Uh, I know maybe this will make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, when we welcome somebody to the ha family, normally like we would like hug on them and like kiss them and do all that kind of stuff. Would you mind just extending your hand toward Jason? Maybe both of them. Jason, I want you to know, brother, that we love you. I want you to know that we are proud of you. Jason, welcome to the family. Amen. And since Jason is with us this morning, uh, what I want all of you to see as we enter into this time of communion is that in adoption we see God's plan and purpose I love what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 5 it says that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure 
as we take these elements, I'm just going to give you a moment to pause and, and to pray. And just, I'm going to give you a moment. Just We're going to take a few moments of silence to start. And in these silent moments, I want you to remember that Christ's sacrifice paid the price for you. To reunite you and to reunite me, to reunite all of us, sons and daughters, to bring us home, to bring us back into the family of God. Take a few moments of just silence together. Father God, I thank you so much for this space, for this opportunity that we have uninhibited, unhindered access to you because of your son, Jesus Christ, because of him, Father God, because of uh, the body and the blood that he shed for us. We're part of the family. Because of him, we find our way home. Because of him, we have life, life to the full. We love you, Father. In your Son, Jesus' name, everyone together says, Amen. Go ahead and go to that next slide. Let's take the bread together. If you have the cup, let's share it together now. Finally, will you pray these words with me? Let's let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, oh man, there we go. <laughs> Try number three. This one's gonna work. Heavenly Father. Thank you for inviting us to this banquet. Help us to remember the gift we have received and to live as brothers and sisters, members of one family. All praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Man, uh, if uh, Craig's teaching or uh, our time together struck a chord with you, uh, Uh, If there's something stirring in that heart of you, if there's a way we could pray for you or serve you, we'd love that opportunity. We'd love that opportunity. So don't just let it rest there. Um, In just a moment, we're going to sing one final song. But before we do so, we've added something to our service recently. Uh, we, We have just felt like partly just due to this season that we're in and some of the struggles that the very tangible, very real struggles that that some some are facing uh, uh, just in, in, our, in our times of worship together, we, we felt so strongly that we needed to just have a special, like, concentrated time of prayer each week. So the last weeks, we, we've prayed for parents, and we've prayed for kids, we've prayed for schools, and we, we want those, those prayers to continue. But today, if you will, I just want us to take a few moments to pray, especially for health care workers. Can we do that? Like right now, this space, like, like, like our, our focus and our prayers are for those in the healthcare industry. And we've got some that, that are in this room right here to, today. So will you join me as we pray, especially for healthcare workers? Father God, we're so thankful to be here. We're so thankful that, that right now, even these words that, that you hear us. Father God, we think we are so thankful for the gifts that you so lavishly pour out into each and every one of us. And Father God, it's, we know it's because of you. We know it's because of, of who you are and it's your creative nature. Father God, because of the gifts that you have poured out on us, we know that in this world there are healers. And those healers are working overtime right now. Father God, I'm so thankful for the special gifting of our healthcare workers. I cannot imagine the level of, of like, 
like like patience and and concentration and energy that's required to do this work and to do it well. And God, it is so vitally needed right now. So God, bless them and lift them up. Father, give our healthcare workers endurance in the face of difficulty. Give them endurance and help them to remember that the struggles they are facing, that, that every struggle, every difficulty, every challenge we face, that Christ has faced that and he has gone before us and given us an example to follow. And because of him, we can endure. Because of him, we could run this race. Father God, give our healthcare workers wisdom as they make decisions. Like, like there are so many things that are happening, Father God, or, or around COVID-19. There's so much like that we just don't know. And so, Father God, give our healthcare workers clarity and, and clearness of, of thought and mind as they move through these things. God, we need their wisdom. Father God, bless our healthcare workers and give them peace. Give them peace despite the storm that surrounds them. God, it's a peace that can only come from you. It's a, it's a peace not tied to the circumstances of this world. It's a peace that comes from you. And Father God, give our healthcare workers hope they face uncertainty. Hope has a power to change things. Hope makes a difference. So Father God, bless our healthcare workers with hope. And Father God, this one, maybe, maybe this seems simple, but it's so important. God, bless our healthcare workers with rest. Give them rest. Maybe their thoughts are racing. Maybe it's they're finding it hard to focus. Maybe they're they're losing sleep at night. And 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 maybe they're just honestly just working long, long, long hours. And so, Father God, give them rest far beyond like like the time they get to sleep. Like like give them uncommon rest. Like like uh, holy rest, God. And finally, God, I just ask, and, and I put this one all on Aspen Grove to you. Father God, give all of our healthcare workers community. So easy to, to feel isolated. It's so easy to, with all of our distancing and mask and space, it's so like, like isolation can, can feel like darkness around us. And so, God, we need community, and our healthcare workers need community, a community of people that are loving them and encouraging them and lifting them up and saying, you can do this, and we're praying for you, and we're thinking of you. And so, Father God, let every healthcare worker feel and be surrounded with amazing people that are lifting them up and holding them up. Father God, we let, let every healthcare worker live into their purpose. We need them now. We need them in these moments. So, Father God, man, just continue to just pour your presence out upon them. Let them feel your strength. Let them know your confidence. Father God, we love you. We know that you hear these words and we trust and we believe and we have faith that you will answer. We offer this prayer in your son Jesus Christ's name and everyone together says, Amen. For I spoke a word you were singing over me. You have been so, so a breath you breathed your life in me 
felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me yes. Though the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found and leaves at 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Yes. Oh, there's no shadow. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall.